back then, they not on Now they all just act on Now I'm hot, they all on Put a lot of Snapchats on I ain't got no Snapchat home I think it's too personal That's what I got Twitter for Instagram, I'm back, yo Back then, they not on Now they all just act on Now I'm hot, they all on Put a lot of Snapchats on I ain't got no Snapchat home I think it's too personal That's what I got Twitter for Instagram, I'm back, yo Like flex on you haters Hi haters This is my world, so it's all in my you're what's going on ladies and gentlemen welcome to another episode of the it's case podcast can i get a year year it's your boy Salvin, aka sav we got kanal on the mic what's good man it's been a minute you know what we haven't done in a minute yeah i don't know man what a draft a draft uh, let's get it let's, let's right get right to it so you know the nba bubble started playoffs is about to start so let's talk about players who outperformed their range in the in the bubble so players like Devin Booker, TJ Warren, Luka, Harden, uh, MPJ like players like that like play, players who popped off in the bubble okay I get it I get it should I flip a coin flip a coin let's get it all right hey Siri flip a coin give me tails tails never fails it's heads so I got oh, man. so I'm gonna go with Dame time aka Damian Lillard okay you got the bubble MVP yeah <laughs> Uh, give me Devin Booker, young Kobe. All right, all right. I'm gonna go with the European player, point guard for the Dallas Mavericks. Solid pick. Luka Doncic. Solid pick. You know, give me the league MVP, Giannis Antetokounmpo. All right, all right. Not a bad pick. I'm gonna go with light skinned dude from Denver Nuggets, Michael Porter Jr. Oh, that's a good pick. Uh, you know, this man's been consistent for his whole career, popping off 30 point games. Give me James Harden. Step back, James. Nice pick, nice pick. I'm going to go with my guy from Brooklyn. You know what it is. Karis LeVert. Good pick. Nice. Right, so give me this kid. You know, he's popped off in the bubble every game, about 30 points, except for against Jimmy Butler. Give me TJ Warren. All right, all right. And now I'm going to go with the pick for my big man, another good passer, Nikola Jokic. It's a good pick. So, you know, you got a big man, but I feel like I got Giannis to guard your center. So give me Kawhi Leonard, lockdown D. All right, all right. So that that leaves our five players for each of our teams. I'm going to just list off who I got on my team, and you do the same. Sounds good. Lillard, Luka Doncic, Michael Porter Jr., um, Karis LeVert, and Nikola Jokic. Okay. I got Devin Booker, James Harden, Giannis Antetokounmpo, Kawhi Leonard, and TJ Warren. This is pretty solid picks. Pretty much who was on the first and second team for the all-bubble teams. And we're going to let our comment section and Instagram as well as YouTube decide who has the better team. Sounds good. Let's go. Keep going. You know what time it is? It's Dame time. So Damian Lillard, he's been popping off in the bubble. Bubble MVP. Only person that has beef with him right now is Skip Bayless. And you know where this all started, right? Uh, it's Clippers game. So Damian Lillard misses two clutch free throws in, in the Clippers game to win that game potentially. Pretty much chokes that game. But they still managed to get into the playoffs. But Skip Bayless calls him out after that game for being not a top player, not being at LeBron's status, and, like, just hating on him. So Damian Lillard comes out, claps back. He's like, when Skip Bayless called me, he backpedaled on everything he said on Undisputed. Thoughts on that? So first off, I want to go back to the Clippers game. Mm-hmm. So that game was really – it could have been crucial. Like, you saw what happened to their playoff season. It exactly. Was by a Karis Levert isolation, it could have come down mm. that close. Yeah, and and for all three Big, teams. Yeah. For all three teams, it was the last game. So. So that the Blazers would have been perfectly in a good position if they won that game before. Exactly. And another thing I want to say is, announcers got to stop with this free throw line jinx. <laughs> it always be saying like, "Oh, and it's so rare that he," free th- and then he misses the next. One. Uh, it happens all the time. He's made ninety out of the last ninety free throws in a row. Oh man, he misses the next one. Like I know it happens all the time. It just I don't I don't know. It's like can they hear them or something? Like what is it? Yeah, and obviously we expect this kind of behavior out of Pat Bev, but mm-hmm. post game Paul George was on one too. Yeah, he called out Damian Lillard saying, "Dame time running out, my G." And I don't know how. Like I don't understand how Paul George has the audacity to say that after mm-hmm. <laughs> Damian Lillard makes like walks him out of the court last year. The really bad part. He just, the, he just did the bye bye last year. Between their family members, like Damian Lillard's sister mm-hmm. and Paul George's wife. Wife, yeah, they're going at it. 
and uh, they they acknowledge that it was mostly just encore banter and mm-hmm. competitiveness and not anything personal. Yeah. So that's and, fun to get into. And and you know Patrick Beverly wasn't even playing that game, so I don't understand why he's chattering on the court when he's not even playing. Like he was healthy, he's healthy enough to play. He chose to say like he had an option to play if he really wanted to come out and play. Now he was chattering. Dame yeah. Lillard called him out on a three. Yeah. He said, "I want you out here." <laughs> yeah, and I think I think the level of Dame's playing that he would he would have done the same thing to Pat Bev that he did to Paul George. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been. Good but now, but now Skip Bayless, he just keeps tweeting at him, keeps like poking the bear, you know. He, he, and after that, after that Clippers game, Dame's been on another level, 61, 50, 40. Like he's been drop, he's popping off. Like it's unbelievable. It's like putting the team on his back. Mm-hmm. Dame fans have a weird place where he's either underrated or overrated, depending on the year it is. Like it's weird. And yeah, but point to a certain extent, it's like. Dame talking like he's LeBron James or a player who's won an MVP, but never really had anything outside of NBA teams and all-star appearances. So, yeah, It's like Dame's in like a weird uh, position in like the tiers because I think he's an elite talent, but he doesn't get the, the recognition that like Steph Curry, Kyrie gets because they've won rings. So like because he hasn't won a ring, he's like in that, like people are like, oh, he's not that good. But like his, his talent is elite. And when he takes over, he takes over. We've seen that time in and time out. But his supporting cast hasn't always been there. That's true. And also, it's really tough for him because he's in the Western Conference. Mm-hmm. Like, am I really going to put him above Steph Curry, James Harden, even Luka? Yeah. So, like, it's just, yeah, like, Luka's younger. So, like, they're like, okay, yeah, like, he's, he's electrifying. But, like, dan has been doing it for so long, so consistently. And just hasn't, just hasn't had the playoff success. He only had first-round playoff success. And even exactly. he has blown a lead. Like, he was the third seed, the Pelican mm-hmm. sixth seed. Drew Holiday and their whole defensive scheme pretty much put the clamps on him. Exactly, exactly. So, like, he's, he's, like, in the middle tier where you want to say he's an elite talent and, like, the top tier, but then, like, he has performances like that that, like, you're like, okay, maybe he hasn't done enough yet. But I think this year might be their year to, like, make some noise because they have a solid team and Lakers are a little banged up without Avery Bradley and Rondo right now. So their guards aren't as, like, their guards aren't there right now. So you never know, man. And the level CJ's playing at, like he played at the other day against the Grizzlies. Yeah, and also in the playing round, Yusuf Nurkic, man. Mm-hmm. The way he was playing, he was playing like a – so inspirational after. Exactly, after his grandmother. Uh, that was good to watch. Like him, like having that – like you you just can't like – can't like – can't you can't even describe the feeling like he probably went through. Like and still coming out and performing like that. Points, 20 rebounds. He was playing like so inspired. Mm-hmm. But, like, uh, the only thing I'm worried about, like, see, I think they, ha- they could put up a good fight against the Lakers. I just don't know how much gas they have left. Because Nur- Nurkic looks tired. Dame looks tired. CJ looks kind of fresh, but CJ has a back injury. We're not worried about their offense, right? It's, we're more so defense. defense. They couldn't stop Karis LeVert and the Brooklyn Nets mm-hmm. on about four straight percent. Even in the second half, uh, John Morant went off. Exactly. They couldn't stop John Morant from getting to the rim. So, it's like – and they didn't even have Jaron Jackson Jr. at that. Mm-hmm. So exactly. So, like, I think they put up a good fight against the Lakers, but like, I'm never doubting LeBron. Like, especially after that Warriors three one comeback, I stopped doubting LeBron. So, yeah, see what happens. But I think they'll put up a good fight. Maybe go six games. I doubt they'll go seven, but I think they could take a six. I think it'll go seven games regardless. But I mm-hmm. think either team has a chance to win. Yeah, it's a, it's a coin flip. Yeah. So speaking of the NBA bubble, we all had one young star outperform all his expectations. His name is Devin Booker. Mm-hmm. And the Phoenix Suns in general, they had about less than a 5% chance by most experts of making the playoffs. And they did not any worse than they possibly could have done. They did as best as they could. Yeah. And so. a bit short, but we got to take a chance to look at their success in the bubble. So mm-hmm. what do you So I'm, 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 I'm huge on betting, right? Like, as you know, and as most of our listeners know, I'm huge on betting. So before the playoffs started and the bu- before the play- NBA bubble started, they had odds odds for every team in the West to make it to the playoffs. So the Blazers, the Pelicans, the Grizzlies, and the Spurs. There were no odds for the Suns listed. Really? Yeah, no odds. And then they they won eight games and were a game away from pretty much making it in. And Devin Booker, man, I feel like after that game winner over Paul George. Mm-hmm. The whole of NBA Twitter was on him. Mm-hmm. Everyone knew he was coming, and the future is bright for him. 
Exactly. No, no. Like he, he's a young player, and everyone wants him to get out of Port, uh, get out of Phoenix. But I think Phoenix has a solid team and a good coaching staff. And like, they're very young. Like they have Ricky Rubio, DeAndre Ayton, um, Malik Bridges. Like they have a solid team where they could build and continue to grow. So when DeAndre George, uh, Draymond Green said, "Get him out of there," I think that's kind of wrong. I think he was low key trying to tamper. <laughs> It, he was trying to get him out to Golden State, but you know, with Phoenix, he's trying to build something, and he's still on contract for a couple of years, so mm-hmm. they're gonna have to wait for that. But I think if he's going to leave, it's got to be to Timberwolves, like yeah, with his boys. <laughs> another thing is, what was DeAndre Ayton doing, missing his COVID test for a podcast? No idea, man. <laughs> <laughs> like it's so simple. Like all you gotta do is get tested every day. I know his playoff hopes are on the line for his team, and <laughs> they always miss that. <laughs> but he he's he's very young too and I think he's like this year was very off for him because he had the issues where he got suspended and then injuries so him and Devin Booker hadn't had a lot of time together so I think that's a big part of it so now I think he's just like getting into his role and understanding like you know I got what I got to do for this team another thing is the Phoenix Suns went without Kelly Oubre Jr. that's a big one gains two key role players on their team so it's really surprising how they did so well and exactly yeah they did really well Right, right after his All Star appearance, he averaged almost thirty game, thirty points per game throughout the bubble. Hit that game winning shot, which was very Kobe esque. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and and every game he said, uh, "Kobe's with me." Like he he said it like every game after every game. So that was really inspiring. Yeah, I think I think he played like he played his heart out. Like he did really well, and he, the Suns as a whole team came into the bu- bubble without a chance, and they put up a great fight, and now everyone knows about him. Exactly. And they're going to be on a lot of teams' radar next year. Exactly, because they're like the next team, like like the next young and upcoming team. Like you gotta you gotta watch them. You, like hopefully, like their GM and everyone, they do things right and add a few more pieces where they could they could take the next step next year. Maybe maybe make a run for the playoffs. Exactly. The West is so tough, but I feel like they have a chance to be in the playoff mix. Yeah, one team like like going after the Suns, right? One team that kind of disappointed me were, were the Grizzlies. Like, I had high hopes for the Grizzlies, and I really wanted, wanted them to get in initially. Like, for me, like, when the bubble started, like, Pelicans, like, I think Zion's all hype. Because Really? He's, okay, he's a great player. He's a great talent, right? But he's barely played any games. So, people comparing him to, like, LeBron and, like, Giannis and, like, Shaq, like, that, those high, high top-tier plays, he hasn't done much. You know, you got to, like, you got to prove yourself. I think he really could have been at that level. But if you see, even just going back to Duke College, it really mm-hmm. made me see, like, Man, this guy's already lost his like lost some athleticism, gained a few pounds. Like, yeah, and he's only like, nineteen twenty. So how how is that possible? Exactly. Like I think he's really talented and he's a really good player, right? But he has flaws in his game. Like he has to do a lot. Like he has to work for it. Like and he's a, he's a great kid. He's humble. He like he seems like a really good person, right? But he got to put in the work. And like I don't want people to just be like, oh, you know, he's the best player in the league. Like because Jao is amazing this year, and I don't even know why there's a debate of who's gonna get rookie of the year or was a debate. And even with Zion, I mean, like, he could have played those last couple minutes, but there's a reason why coaches and the Pelicans are keeping him out. Mm-hmm, exactly. And they got to figure that out because figure that he's 20 years old and he's supposed to be a franchise player. How, how is that possible? Like, mm-hmm. I know so, some people can be what's quoted as injury prone, but if he's your franchise player and your playoff lives are on this line like that, you got to go for it. Exactly. I agree. Because the bubble was structured – for the Pelicans to get in. Like, the NBA wants to make Zion the face of their league. Mm -hmm. And another thing is with the Pelicans is J.J. Reddick's playoff streak was on the line, too. (laughs) He was on the the sideline of the Spurs game. Mm -hmm. He saw his whole life flash. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I don't know what happened with that team, man. Like, they had had an easy schedule going in. And they should have been able to win more games. Even even the Grizzlies, same thing with them. They didn't have a they had a hard schedule towards the back end of their schedule, but like the front end was pretty easy. They should have won those games and capitalized. But I feel like with the Grizzlies, they had everything to lose, whereas all the other teams had everything to gain. Yeah, that's true. But they they also had a three game advantage on all of these teams. Yeah, so and they they, sh- they shouldn't have dropped down to the ninth seed and had to win two games. Like if they won a few more games, they would have been easily the eighth seed, and all they had to do was win one game. Yeah. But they also had injuries to Jaron Jackson Jr. Yeah, that was a big that was a big blow. Yeah. Another thing is, what do you think about Lonzo's performance in the bubble? He was a no-show, man. No, he he, he did terrible. 
he did terrible. It's like he wasn't even there. And I, like after Brandon in- Ingram, he like Zion obviously is the top player. Brandon Ingram's right there, and then next is Lonzo. I mean, we started off with the bubble saying, "Oh man, look at Bi," but mm-hmm. happened to Lonzo. It's like, where is he at? And we we did the teams when we did uh, the Pelicans overview. Lonzo was supposed to be our X factor, and he and he didn't show up. Exactly, his field goal percentage was like below thirty percent every game. Yeah. Yeah, like he, I, like I, like he's he's supposed to be like for that team. He's supposed to slow down the pace. Like some of his passes to Zion were crazy, but that's what he does. Like you know, play defense, get those passes, and slow down the pace for your offense. Yeah, another big surprise player for everyone in the NBA community was TJ Warren. TJ Warren, man, playing like, <laughs> oh my god, he's playing like Jordan after he says it's personal for me. <laughs> it started off with the Sixers, so I had to see it firsthand. First game. Game. Popped off with 50 points, man. I, like, it was unbelievable. He looked like he looked like 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 LeBron out there, like the first game. It was crazy. And I thought it was just a fluke, but he just carried on and averaged 31 points in the bubble. The thing with TJ Warren is we always knew he could, he could score. He's been a mm-hmm. consistent 19, high high 18, 19, that kind of. Yeah, he's he's a yeah, he's a solid player. What he improved on was his three point shooting ability because he was yeah. a mid range scorer, but he worked on his game throughout mm-hmm. the. He off- took it to the next level in the bubble. He, he really improved his three-point shot because the majority of his shots that he scores are contested shots. So he really works for it, and he's that skilled. Exactly. He's a, he's a really solid player. And the Pacers have a solid – like, the Pacers have good coaching and a good team. Well, like, even – like, Sabonis not being with them is big. But with Brogdon coming back and Victor Owen Depot, if he, like, matches, like, his top performance, like, they'll be a good team and be a tough out. And you combine that with his competitiveness, the sky's the future. Like, the sky's the limit for mm-hmm. – No, they – the. The Pacers are a tough team. Like, they have solid players that want to play and want to give it their all, like, including TJ Warren. And I'm excited for that playoff matchup with the Pacers. Mm-hmm. The beef between Jimmy Butler and TJ Warren. You're- he, can't, he can't do what he did against the Heat last time. I don't, want, I don't want TJ Warren just showing up with 12 points. I know. I, I'm, I'm looking forward to, what, to seeing what he's going to do. Mm-hmm. Another young player, you know, your guy, Michael Porter Jr. Yes, sir. <laughs> he, he, he also showed up in the bubble. I mean, we knew that he was always capable of this. Like, the pre-draft expectations for that draft with Luke, uh, the 2018 NBA draft with Luca mm-hmm. and Trey Young, they weren't even saying they were going to be the top picks. They were saying the first pick should be Michael Porter Jr. Exactly. Decide. Because he has the same potential as a KD-type player. Yeah, he's tall, lanky, and he can score. Score from all three levels. And I was, like, I was, like, in that draft, right, we, the Sixers had the 10th pick. So I was surprised. Like, I know why we didn't want him because of the injuries and we want to – we're focused to winning now. But right after – like, the Knicks were right there when they took Kevin Knox. Like, Knicks messed up too, man. Like, yeah. I don't know how he fell that far back because in the draft I was seeing I was like, oh, Michael Porter's going to go next. Michael Porter's going to go next. And so many players went ahead of him that shouldn't have. And the whole thing with Michael Porter Jr. is opportunity and a lot of young players. You saw with Coach Mike Malone that he sometimes benches him when he makes a mistake. Mm-hmm in that opportunity and he's given the confidence by your coach and the players around you he could do he could do it all and I think one thing that like benefited him was Will Barton and Jamal Murray being injured exactly so he has more of an opportunity to carry the scoring load because before before the before the bubble he only averaged seven points and barely got minutes he got 14 minutes and averaged seven points after the bubble he was averaging 22 points and he had flurries of games throughout the pre-bubble that mm-hmm. like 20 points 15 rebounds 20 points 10 rebounds when players were injured but now you pull him at full strength him and bull bull yeah my god yeah i know they have a really good like they have a good balance of like a good mix of players on their team and i think michael porter will be a big factor for them going into the playoffs because that like that'll most likely like be like their next guy and if michael porter could be their second best player and reach that potential with Jokic murray like that team will be really good and speaking of the Nuggets playoff matchup, they're facing off against the Jazz. Mm-hmm. But news just came out that Mike Conley has left the bubble to see the birth of his son. So that's going to be a big question to see how the Jazz are going to face up against the Nuggets. Yeah, I think the Jazz, it sucks for them because they signed Bogdanovich and Michael Porter this summer. Like those, those were their guys that were going to come in and take over for the team. And both of them aren't, a, a show, they aren't going to be in the, the Wait, first round of the playoffs. And Mike Conley? Hmm? Bogdanovich and Mike Conley, right? Yeah. yeah I think you said Ray Jr. Okay, yeah, Mike, Mike, Mike Conley, my bad. So yeah. Mike Conley and Bogdanovich aren't going to be there. So those are big players on their team, two of their starting five. They were supposed to expect it to make the next step with those two players, 
mm-hmm. because Donovan Mitchell and the Jazz, they always kind of make the playoffs, but they don't really have deep playoff runs. Yeah, because they don't have – like, so Rudy Gobert is a solid player, but he's not a scorer. So Donovan Mitchell has to do – take – carry the load. But when they had Bogdanovich and Mike Conley, like, they were able to help out and balance the offense up a little. Exactly. Make sure you guys go check out Kentucky Hoops. They got some great content and amazing posts, and follow them too. All right, so now let's talk about my team, the Brooklyn Nets. I mean, they went into the bubble really shorthanded, and even inside veteran players like Michael Beasley, Jamal Crawford. And we didn't really expect much out of this team in the bubble, but they exceeded expectations by far. Went mm-hmm. five and three in the bubble, beat teams like the Milwaukee Bucks, Los Angeles Clippers, and Karis Avert has been shining throughout this as a very young, bright star. What are your thoughts? So initially, you know, we didn't really expect much from the Nets and neither did I. I was like, okay, maybe they'll play like, they'll win like three or four games, but they, they really played really well. And each game they played, they were in it. Their coaching staff was amazing. Karis LeVert was different. Like he, like when you gave him the opportunity, he blossomed. Exactly. Another thing with the Nets is they always played super hard with grit and with passion on the floor. Like Joe mm-hmm. Harris, a lot of people just see him as a shooter. He's more than a shooter. He tries his hardest on defense. Cuts without the ball, gets layups here and there. Timothy Luau Cabarro plays mm-hmm. different on the off the bench. Like their team is just different. Yeah, they, they have a really solid team. And the only thing like like that I'm concerned for is their future. Because like now, how are the young players and the like the older veterans gonna the mesh? But hopefully they find a trade where they could trade one of the younger stars and get like another all star out of it. But like their future is bright. They have a solid team and they 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 play really well this this bubble team during the bubble and their season's still not done. So you never know. They could upset the Raptors. They even made it really tough for the Blazers and their playoff lines were on the, their, their playoff mm-hmm. open line too. Exactly. Cause they're playing with nothing to lose. They, they have, they have absolutely nothing to lose. Cause nobody wants, nobody cares if they, how they play. They're all like, okay, they have no KD. They have no Kyrie, but Levert doesn't care. Joe Harris doesn't care. Jared Allen doesn't care. Exactly. And even they play without some games without those three players and they still won against the Bucks. Like, yeah, it's crazy. So what about Jock Vaughn and his coaching style? I think after Kenny Atkinson left, nobody had any expectations. Like, usually, like, you know, when an interim coach comes in, nobody really cares about him. He's just there in the lineup and taking over for a little bit. Yeah. But he actually did really well for the team, and he – the players want to play for him, and that's what it looks like right now. Players are – he's building a solid culture for these young guys, and they want to show up for him. And another thing with Jock Vaughn is their coaching staff went into the bubble with the expectation of, let's actually make this a run. Like, let's try our hardest, do as best as we possibly can. Mm. And it's, like, same with him and the team. He has nothing to lose. Like, we, like he doesn't know what's going to hold, like, what holds for him in the future. Like, he doesn't know if he's going to be the head coach or what. But he's playing like he's the head coach right now, and he's coaching them to the top tier, at the top tier. Exactly. And what I want to see in the future is giving every coach a very detailed, like, application process. Like, I want mm-hmm. them to look at every possible coach and, cover all their possibilities and pick the absolute best coach for both the veterans and young players to have the best possible chance to win the championship. Yeah. So I think like for him, right. And the Nets, I don't think he'll have the job next year because what they're looking for is a championship caliber coach who could take him over the, over the hump. So someone like Tyron Lu that could, that knows how to coach a, like a KD or a Kyrie. So I think that's what they're looking for. But a guy like him, he could, he could take over a young team, like, Maybe, maybe like I, I can't, I don't know, but like a young team, you could take over and like help them go oh. over, like the next, take the next step. The Pelicans, maybe. Maybe the Pel. Ah, I don't know. Pelicans are looking for like Tyron Lue too. Yeah. Another thing with the Nets is I want them to keep Karis LeVert by all means, no matter what. Mm-hmm. And trade somebody, just don't trade Karis LeVert, please. <laughs> and <laughs> what about Spencer Dinwiddie? Well, I mean Spencer Dinwiddie. We'll have to see how he comes back after having coronavirus and. The layoff with because I think he's a solid player too. Yeah, and I, I think Nets will have to decide who they want to keep between the two. Yeah, and Joe Harris is going to be a free agent this summer, so he's going to have some market share for sure. Yeah, I think I think Joe Harris is another one they should try to keep because he's a player that could fit on any team. Like shooters like him, like you could just throw in there and he's going to shoot. He's going to shoot the ball. I think it should keep Karis LeVert and Joe Harris. Mm-hmm. If they were going to trade, they're going to have to use one of those three players. So if they had to choose. They're probably at the trade Spencer Dinwiddie, but I'm also fine with them just keeping the team mostly as is. Yeah, I think I think what they're probably gonna try to seek is try to trade like either Dinwiddie or Levert, keep one of them, and then Jared Allen and like a couple picks and try to get like a Bradley Beal or Zach Levine or someone of that caliber. Right. 
But I, I'm also fine with Judd and MJ. The team has it is, and they'll really have a solid shot to make damage in the Eastern Conference. Yeah, they have a solid team. Okay, so let's switch over to my team, the Philadelphia 76ers. It's been an up and down bubble season. You know, Simmons shoots a three, Simmons gets hurt, Embiid gets hurt, Embiid comes back, hurts his hand, comes back. A lot going on. What about Ben Simmons? So Ben Simmons is out for the time being, but they're saying if we make a deep run, he might come back. So that's iffy because, you know, we have to make a deep run first, and then he has to come back. Simmons first, man. The court is not the only thing he's missing. He only, he's also missing his girl, Kendall Jenner. From his... yeah, I don't even listen, man. It's listen. I don't want that curse. Devin Booker. <laughs> I don't want that curse, man. He could Devin Booker could keep her. I don't want Simmons anywhere close to her. Devin Booker, man, he's been popping off. Yeah, but every every time she came to a game last year, we lost. <laughs> no. <laughs> so I don't, I don't want that. But you know, Simmons is our best like on ball defender. So losing him is big. But Surprisingly, our offense has been more efficient with him off the court. So, in a way, it's a blessing because Embiid will have a lot more space to operate and uh, you could push shooters around him and maybe he'll pop off and like he should. Like he'll, He's going to have to drop like 40 points a game for us to have a chance against something. It's going to be a tough matchup, but we're 3-1 three and one, three and one against them during the regular season. So, I think we have a puncher's chance. Embiid's got to take advantage of the low post area. He can't be shooting threes or pump faking, trying to – be outside of the mid-range. He's got to be in the paint and operating out of there. And yeah. the Sixers shooters got to perform above their potential with Cork Maz and then um, Josh Richardson, maybe potentially. Yeah, and Tobias Harris will be big too because this year has been he's been taking he's taken a big step defend, defend, defensively. So for him to continue that, and he's gonna have to match up against Tatum or Brown. So he's gonna have to be able to be able to stay stay stick his ground and guard those guys. Like Tatum's gonna pop off for 20, 30 every game. But just to slow him down a little bit, especially in the fourth quarter, will be huge. For their playoff matchup, though, I think the Celtics have a really a far advantage because they have the better roster as well as better coach. And coaching goes a long way, especially in the bubble. With, yeah. Without, like, that kind of noise from the playoffs, it's going to be different. Yeah, I know. But I think it'll, it'll be good for Embiid because every season we've been having to play, like, as favorites. And we've been, like, it, there's so much to lose. But this year with Simmons out, the Sixers, gonna, hopefully they play like they have nothing to lose and go all out. And Embiid's been saying, it, give me the ball. I want the ball. This is an opportunity to show up to it. And if in the future, I, I don't think they will, but if they have to make a decision between Simmons and Embiid, this will tell us who they're going to pick. And if the Sixers don't perform this playoffs, they're going to fire the coach first, I hope. Yeah, I think Brett Brown, I think he's a solid coach and he's done a good job over like his tenure with us, like the process and going through all those young players. I think he's done a really good job and keeping the culture strong. But to a certain point, like the Warriors had to do this with Mark Jackson and the Eagles had to do this with Andy Reid. Like you need a new set of eyes to take the team to the next level. Like every young team needs this. Like a guy that's development, developmental and a good coach for prospects, he's not the same coach for stars. I got the Celtics probably winning in a closer in a earlier series. But if the Sixers were to make a chance, it'd have to go seven games. I don't see them winning a four-game or five-game, six-game series. Yeah, I don't think it's going to be a close series regardless. I think it's going at least six, in my opinion. Regardless of who wins, I think it's going to go six. But for us to have a chance, it has to go through and beat. And Al Horford has to play. Like, Al Horford's been playing really well in the bubble. So I hope he continues to do that. And, and we got a chance. Would you pick Simmons or Embiid for the future? It's a tough question, man. So Simmons, because Simmons' ceiling is a lot higher. Because Simmons can do Giannis-like things. Like, his ability is there. And if he could develop a slightly better shot, I think he could take us to the next level with pieces around him. And you could do the same thing. And and be, the only thing with Embiid, right, like centers aren't the future. Like, the league is moving away from centers. There aren't that many elite centers. Embiid's one of them. Jokic is one of them. And that's all, like, top two centers. Like, I don't even consider Rudy Gobert a game changer. I, I would – I'd rather go with Embiid just because Ben Simmons hasn't developed a shot yet, and his aggression level isn't the same as Embiid. Like, you could see a Embiid's on-court competitive yeah. as well as off the court. Mm-hmm. Simmons is just chilling and, like – Yeah. He has – so, with Simmons, what I see a lot of is, like, the mentality LeBron had. You know, like, like I want to make the best play. I don't want to shoot the ball. I want to – like I don't want to take I don't want to take over. I want to, I want him to take over. 
But with Embiid, he talks his talk mm-hmm. and then backs it up on the court, which is real exactly for a player. Embiid has that mentality where he wants to close out the game and take over. Simmons doesn't have that. Which is why I'd rather pick Embiid, injuries aside, because they're both yeah. both had their fair share of injuries. So yeah, but like I, I think I think the management can put a solid team around both like both of them, yeah. including Tobias Harris. You keep Tobias Harris and Embiid and Simmons, and you could put the right pieces around him. They'll they'll do well. You the real MVP.